<laughs> Welcome, everybody. <laughs> um, so, so I want to talk about three things during this, this initial talk. First, I want to give a more formal welcome um, and, and talk about the big picture of the Summer Institute. And then um, we're going to get into the first substantive part of the, um, of the course, um, which is foundational for everything that's going to happen over the next two weeks. Um, and then we'll relate um, that basic causal model that we'll start with to the content of the next two weeks. Um, so um, as you can probably tell, we're very excited uh, about the, um, this course, the Summer Institute. Um, and we're eager to hear your feedback and suggestions for how to, uh, you know, we think we worked very hard on it. We think it's good, but we, we can always get better. And we look forward to hearing your feedback about um, how we can improve it. Um, we're very grateful to the Russell Sage Foundation um, for providing funding. Um, and the Russell Sage Foundation uh, offers a number of different grant programs. Um, so I encourage you to, to check those out. Um, they're, they have regular grants um, on a number of topics uh, in the social sciences. They also offer small grants for PhD students. And for faculty, there are grants to spend a year um, in a, a small group with, with other faculty with similar interests. Um, so, um, so, so look up the Russell Sage Foundation. We're grateful to um, my wife, Samantha Cherney, uh, who you've already met, um, for handling the logistics, for getting all of this um, set up. Um, Monica Pena, um, who you won't meet. She's at UCLA, but she's done a lot of work behind the scenes. Uh, for setting uh, for setting everything up with the hotel and with with Heath who's, do, who's doing the video and um, and others, um, we're grateful to Add Health for making the data available. That's a very special feature of this um, of this program that we, you actually get access to real genetic data that you can you can work on and, and phenotype data. Um, the NDER um, is providing the server that you'll have access to for doing the computational uh, problems. Um, and we're grateful to all of the instructors who are all volunteering their time, taking time out from their research, their schedules, their child care, all sorts of other things in order to, um, to be here with you. Um, OK, so um, this is about, this course is about social science genomics. Um, we think of social science genomics as in broadly encompassing the use of genetic data in social science research. Um, we think there's lots of great reasons to be doing social science genomics, lots of potential payoffs for um, the kinds of questions we're interested in the social sciences. And some of the lectures today are going to be about exactly that, about the payoffs, about the, the usefulness in psychology, the usefulness in sociology. Um, but um, I want to be very clear at the outset, um, and this is a theme we'll return to throughout the um, the two weeks, there's a lot of challenges um, in this area about the uh, appropriate use of the research, the appropriate interpretation of the results, and how we communicate those results to other scientists and to the general public. Um, so Daphne uh, Marchenko and Michelle Meyer are going to give lectures that are specifically about the ethical and communication uh, challenges of this work. Um, I mean, th these are, of course, issues that are important broadly in whatever field of research we're working in. But it's especially important when we're, we're talking about genomics and behavior and policy uh, because there's a, um, uh, an awful history um, of eugenics and, and other bad uses and bad interpretations um, of the research that we always are going to need to keep in our mind. Um, another uh, related. Uh, different but related set of issues um, is about the research itself, the conduct of that research, and how to do research in general in a responsible way. Um, and, and so you know, these, are, these are issues that are going to come up uh, again and again throughout the two weeks. OK. So um, genetic data is, I mean, why, why do we think it's um, you know, why do we need a, a, a course that's specifically, or a topic specifically, about the use of genetic data in the social sciences? W you know, what's, why are we treating genetic data 
um, as special? Well, I think there's a number of reasons why it is special. Um, so for one thing, um, different DNA is at the root of what makes us different biologically. It's the main, the main thing that makes us different from each other biologically. Um, our DNA, um, like almost, um, you know, like very few other variables in the social sciences, it's something that is um, what we would say call predetermined, which means it's something that is fixed at a, um, before a time of later behavior or investment or choices that we make. It's, it's fixed at the moment that we're conceived. Um, it's also um, randomly assigned, which is extremely conditional on your parents. So conditional on your parents, there's a, um, a meiotic event that determines which DNA you get from, from which parent. And that's a natural experiment that can be exploited to um, draw causal inferences. So the, the combination of predetermined and randomly assigned makes uh, genetic data especially useful for thinking about issues of causation. Um, is also unlike a lot of other variables in the social sciences in that it is, in, at least in principle, there's a, there's a finite amount of DNA that each person has and in, it's in principle you could measure all of it. Um, it's, also, it's also possible in principle to know the function of any particular piece of DNA, what it's doing biologically, and that's, that's useful for understanding uh, mechanism. Um, and, um, you know, I think another useful thing about genetic data, not unique, um, but useful is that it's, it's, uh, it's an example of big data, and so a lot of the methods and, um, and issues that come up with uh, computation um, generalize also to other kinds of data that um, you might be interested in if, you, if, you, uh, if you're interested in big data. Um, and finally, there's a large body of existing knowledge about genetics. Um, there's the biology of genetics. There's population genetics about how different, uh, about how um, alleles um, uh, change in their distribution over time with different populations. There's quantitative genetics. Um, so there's, there's lots of bodies of knowledge that we're going to be able to draw on when we study and analyze genetic data. Um, and so that's, that's part of why it's important to have a course like this, because if you want to use the data, you have to know a lot of other stuff um, that, uh, in order to be able to use it correctly and interpret it appropriately. Okay. Um, why is now a good time to be at the Russell Sage Foundation Summer Institute in Social Science Genomics? Um, well, um, I would argue it's, it, it is a very good time because um, there are rapid advances in our understanding uh, of how genetic variation relates to behavior. Fundamentally, I think those rapid advances are due to um, the decline in cost of measuring genetic variation across people, um, which has meant that there's, there's an enormous amount of DNA data out there that can, we can use for mapping between specific genetic variants and various kinds of outcomes, including um, diseases and uh, behaviors and social science outcomes. Um, so here's uh, a, a, a one way of quantifying the um, decline in costs. What this shows is, um, this is data that was collected uh, by the National Human Genome Research Institute, which is part of NIH. The x-axis here is um, time going from 2001 when, as we learned last night, it was the, <laughs> the announcement of the completion of the Human Genome Project, although not actually uh, when the Human Genome Project themselves considers it to have been completed, um, through to um, 2020. Um, the the y-axis is the cost of um, sequencing a single human genome. So sequencing meaning measuring essentially every base pair um, in the genome. And what's it's important to note here, the y-axis is on a log scale. So 
um, what they're saying here is that they estimated 2001 it would have costed would have cost to start from scratch a uh, hundred million dollars to sequence a single person's genome um, uh, whereas now it costs or in 2020 it costs about a thousand dollars to sequence a single person's genome um, and the decline on this log scale is um, uh, is quite fast. So what they're showing here by comparison in this white line is Moore's Law, which is uh, a particular kind of decline in exponential um, cost that corresponds to uh, the increase in um, or the decline in cost of computer processing power, uh, which is taken as an, a leading example of very fast decline in costs. And you can see that the cost of sequencing the human genome has been falling faster than that. Um, now, this is sequencing data. We're not going to mostly be talking about sequencing data over this two weeks. We're going to be talking about um, um, SNP data or uh, SNP array data, uh, genotyping data, genome-wide genotyping data, which is much cheaper uh, than $1,000 per person today. It's more like $30 a person. That cost has also been declining um, very, very rapidly. Okay, so because of that decline in cost, there's been a lot of data and, and therefore a lot of discoveries um, and a lot of data for social scientists to potentially um, use in uh, social science applications. Um, so a number of large social science data sets are, have made genetic data available. We're going to talk about a number of them. There's the ad health data that you're going to have access to during these two weeks the Health and Retirement Study, the English Longitudinal Study of Aging, um, the UK Biobank uh, has a lot of interesting social science data, and there's a number of other data sets that, are, that either have or are about to um, add genetic data. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, there's been dramatic advances in our linking of genetic variation to behavioral phenotypes. And we're, um, for some, social science outcomes like educational attainment were already getting pretty substantial predictive power from genetic data and for many other phenotypes as you'll see we're at the cusp of getting uh, much more predictive power so it's a so you know getting involved now you are getting in more or less on the ground floor uh, of um, a, a field that I think is um, taking off very quickly okay so um, let me say something about who we are who are organizing the Summer Institute um, and, and teaching at it. The instructors are coming from a range of different disciplines in the social sciences, so economics, sociology, psychology, um, as well as um, several of the instructors are geneticists um, and, and uh, several have background in bioethics. Um, I. Uh, you know, the instructors are among the leaders uh, in the field, so you're very lucky to have, uh, I'm not talking about myself, I'm talking about the other instructors. Um, several of us have been involved with, um, with the Russell Sage Foundation um, in a number of other capacities besides this one, um, so I encourage you also to ask us, you know, beyond issues of the Summer Institute, feel free to ask us questions about the, the Russell Sage Foundation. Okay, and I mentioned this before about the other awards that RSF offers. Um, one uh, group that you're going to hear about again and again um, over these two weeks is the Social Science Genetic Association Consortium. A number of us are affiliated with it, um, so that's part of why you're going you're to hear about it a lot. Um, the SSGAC um, is an, an organization that coordinates genome-wide association studies of behavioral phenotypes, so it's producing a lot of the, the knowledge that we're going to be drawing on um, for the uh, applications that we're going to talk about. Um, the goal, our goal of the SSGAC is to create tools to enable, to facilitate social science uh, genomics research like polygenic indexes, which are predictive variables that combine information from um, genetic variants throughout the genome. And one of our goals of the SSGAC is to also promote good research practices 
um, within the field, for example, conducting power calculations before conducting a study, pre-registering studies where possible, and complete reporting all analyses that were done, um, posting results publicly, but keeping in mind the um, ethical uh, considerations of, of good, use, good downstream uses of the data. Um, so we'll be talking about um, a lot of these issues uh, over the two weeks as well. Um, so uh, the three organizers, you met us uh, last night. Um, there's David, Patrick, and myself. Um, all of us are, have a background in, in economics. Um, I'm at UCLA. David is at NYU. Patrick is at USC. OK, so um, we have a few goals with the Summer Institute. Um, the most important from our point of view is to help you develop your own research ideas, incorporating genetic data into topics of research that you're excited about. Um, we also want you um, to learn how to implement and interpret uh, the methods of the field. And um, a lot of the, the content of the course is going to be on subjects that we don't actually expect you to do research on yourself, but they're important foundations for, for example, you know, where the polygenic indexes are coming from that you might be using in your own work. And it's important if you're going to be using those tools to know where they come from and be a discerning consumer of you know, which research you can rely on and, and which you can't. Um, uh, we also want you to learn about um, some of the data that's out there and, and learn some of the software that's useful for analyzing that data um, and to learn about good research practices, that many of which go beyond just the, the area of social science genomics. So um, our, uh, the philosophy that drives the way we constructed the course um, is, uh, has a few elements to it. One is that the field is empirically driven, um, ultimately. And so we think it's really important to, for you to have access to real data that you can begin to, to analyze using what we uh, talk about. Um, so that, I think that's a, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, an important and unique part of this, uh, this course. We also think that the, the core theoretical ideas are essential. So there are, you know, there are other opportunities um, where you might be able to learn about how to run particular kinds of programs or software, um, but, um, uh, but sometimes you don't understand as deeply what's going on underneath when you're doing those things. And so, um, so we're trying to combine both of those. We want to give you, through the lectures and the problem sets, the, the theory, and then also have you um, implement the uh, methods on the data. And we think that understanding the theory is crucial for finding good research questions and interpreting the findings. OK, so, so we're going to emphasize the key theoretical ideas um, through simple models and the problem sets, which are central. Um, and you know, this, we apologize in advance for the imperfection that we're going to have on this front, but we're going to do our best to have uniform notation across the lectures to make it easier to understand um, how the different ideas relate to each other. So this two weeks is an immersive learning experience. Um, we, the instructors, have uh, put our own research and other commitments on hold for two weeks um, to just commit to being um, with you. Um, we expect you to be very, very busy um, during, during the weeks um, with days full of lectures and um, a lot of time on the problem sets. We, we also Hopefully, you've done as much of the readings in advance as, as you could. You may also want to do, do some readings that you didn't get to uh, to complement the, the, the lectures. Um, but we also want you to spend time thinking about research ideas, talking with each other and with us um, about um, how you might bring some of these ideas to your own work. So we encourage you to go to the office hours. Um, 
we're, you know, whatever instructors are, are around are going to be available for office hours, and you should take advantage of that. Um, we encourage you to work on the problem sets in groups. That's a great way to get help with the parts that are more difficult for you um, and, uh, and figure things out together. Um, we also want you to get to know each other um, as potential collaborators. Um, as uh, we've said already um, by, by email, but just to remind you, we expect everyone to participate in all aspects of the program. Um, all meals are provided um, except over the weekend. So from Friday dinner through Sunday lunch, um, you're on your own. And then we're back again for Sunday dinner um, next week. Um, Samantha is the contact person for any logistical issues. Email the RSF email address or in emergencies call either her cell phone or my cell phone. OK, so the, the purpose of the problem sets is to teach the material, um, a mix of, of theory and practice. They're supposed to be challenging. Um, so, so one thing which is, which is very important um, is don't just do the problem sets and turn them in and then not look at them again. We want you to look at the solutions and compare the solutions to um, the answers you gave because um, that's how you realize if there are things that you didn't fully understand. Um, and talk with us uh, and, and the TAs. Um, about anything that isn't entirely clear. We, we want you to, to ideally understand 100% of, um, of what's in there. Um, so the TAs um, who you've already met, Grant and Tammy, um, we're very grateful for, for um, their um, helping us with the course. They're, um, uh, they are both, um, they've both been through uh, all of this material in some form or another, um, so they're very experienced with, um, uh, with everything we're going to talk about. OK, so um, for the computing part of the course, you're going to have access to both the clean data from Ad Health as well as the raw data and the code that was used to create the clean data. Now, we expect you to be using the clean data. Um, but because in practice, what you're going to actually get access to when you get access to some other data set is raw data, we think it's useful to provide you with the code we use to go from one to the other. So I encourage, we encourage you to look, look at that. Um, you're also going to have the Ad Health Codebook, which describes all the variables that you have access to. And we got you access to many, many variables, many phenotypes in Ad Health. Um, when you apply in practice to Ad Health, you have to, it has to be for a specific research project, and you have to say which variables you're going to need for that project. So you probably wouldn't have access to as many variables as you're going to have now. So this is a great opportunity to explore, um, you know, explore the data and figure out what, what you might want to do a, a research project on. Uh, you'll have access to the NBER server, which has the data and the software that you can use to analyze it. Um, you should now all have your server password, which was given to you on paper. If you don't, make sure you talk to Grant and Tammy to, to get it. Do not record it electronically. Um, we want it to just remain uh, on paper for security reasons. Um, and very, very importantly, do not download anything from the server um, uh, or take pictures of your screen or anything like that. You know, this is all, it's got to be. Um, uh, completely secure, we promise, to, to um, NBER and to Ad Health. Um, and you are responsible for making sure that the data remain secure and that the respondents remain non-identifiable. OK, so, uh, so I already mentioned some of this about the office hours. Um, any faculty is around, any faculty who's here will be available for the office hours. A number of us are going to be around for the full two weeks. So in addition to David Patrick and myself and Grant and Tammy, um, Alex Young, who maybe raise your hand, Alex. People know who you are. Alex will be here. Uh, James Lee will be here, although I don't think he's actually. Okay. What's that? He arrives today. Oh, he arrives today. OK. Um, so he'll be here. And then Raymond uh, Walters, as well, will be here for the full two weeks. Um, and, and so we'll talk more about office hours when the, the first office hours uh, comes up. 
OK, so now we're going to move into um, the, the material, um, the, the causal model of genetic effects. So um, you, you, this is the, the foundational model uh, for everything we're going to talk about in the next two weeks. You did a version of this model on problem set one. Where you did it for a single locus. And what we're going to do now is the general case where we're talking about um, the entire genome at once. Um, one thing I want to warn you about is that it is um, the, what I'm going to tell you over the next few minutes is deceptively simple. Um, it's easy to, to kind of nod your head and it, sounds, it all sounds reasonable. Um, um, but it's actually that there's some deep insights um, that are important to, to keep in mind. So, so make sure you, um, um, you make sure you understand this and, and go back through it through it carefully um, and, and think about uh, what it means. I'm going to try to highlight why, why the different pieces are important as we go through it. OK, so we're going to think about some outcome, uh, which in genetics uh, we call a phenotype. Phenotype refers to any genetically influenced outcome. The, the outcome that we can have in mind, um, because it'll be a leading example through a lot of what we'll talk about, is educational attainment. But it could, this could be anything. So we'll call that Y and subscript it by I for the individual. Um, so each individual uh, I at each location in the genome, um, uh, which will which will subscript by J, um, has a genotype, which is uh, a 0, 1, or 2. Um, so the, that, um, so as you talked about, on the, as you saw on the problem set, uh, at almost every locus in the genome, there's one of two alleles that can occur. One of them is taken as the reference. Doesn't matter which one you, you pick. And then we're just counting. Um, um, the number of the reference alleles that you have in total, because you get one from your mother, one from your father. If you get zero of the reference, if you get, if you get the reference allele from neither parent, then you, you get the other allele from both parents, then you're a zero. If you get the reference allele from one parent, but not the other, then you're a one. If you get the reference allele from both parents, it's a two. Okay, so the genotype data is this long vector of zero, ones, and twos. Um, and you know you can think of it in the typical data we're gonna we're gonna deal with. It's the the vector is um, 10 million long. Um, in in the human genome, uh, it's it's three billion long. So, um, but for reasons we'll talk about later, that 10 million long vector is capturing most of the common variation uh, between people. Okay, so here's the vector which we're gonna denote by this bold x. Sub i, so individual i's genotype vector. This is you can think of this as the um, the the um, actually I'm going to think of this. <laughs> I know I'm throwing out a lot of numbers here. But I'm going to think of this as about 50 million long, and the reason is there's about f of the three billion base pairs in the genome. There's about 50 million of them that actually where people differ from each other, um, and those are the ones we're going to care about. Um, most of the rest of the genome is just building the basic instructions for building a human being, and then it's this 50 million uh, locations where people are differing from each other. So that's, the, that's what we're going to summarize in this, in this vector for each individual. And from, not for all purposes, but for most purposes in where we're going to apply genetic data in the social sciences, we're interested in causal effects. So we want to know um, the causal effect of, of some genetic variant on the outcome. And what do we mean by the causal effect? We mean that there's, um, we're going to imagine some randomized experiment where we intervene at conception and change the genotype of the person. And we want to know what would ultimately be the outcome on the person's phenotype from that experiment, that experimental change. Now, um, you know, in, in we can actually do that experiment. That experiment is done in model organisms, um, in yeast, uh, or in some, some animals. Um, 
obviously, you know, you can't do it in humans. We don't do it in humans. We wouldn't want to do it in humans. Um, but it's still um, the conceptual idea that we have in mind when we think about um, what we mean by the causal effect. Um, now, in, in, um, if you just looked at associations about how variation in some genotype is correlated with some outcome, you're not necessarily getting that causal effect. So what are some reasons why it might be that variation or genotype might be predictive of the phenotype but not causal. Population okay, it's population stratification. So, what, what do you mean by that? Right, so you might have two groups in the population that for population genetic reasons have different genotype frequencies. They diverge from each other because they, 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 they mate more within their group than across groups. Um, so that's the stratification of the population that there's, there's these genetically different groups in terms of allele frequencies. And in, um, uh, in, in the, the example, um, remind me your, your name? Tamkina. Ta okay. um, in, in the example, the one of the groups is more powerful socially and has blue eyes. Um, and, the, and so the alleles that are associated with blue eyes are going to be predictive of outcomes like educational attainment that only the powerful people in society get. Okay, so that, that's, a, that's a great example. And an, and an important kind of example, that population stratification is something we're going to talk about a lot. Can you think of other other examples? Tammy. Um, like majority gene environment interactions, there is a certain genotype result in um, a certain environment being more common, but that, and it's actually the environment that impacts the, gene, the, the phenotype rather than the gene. Good, yeah. So, so can, can you give a concrete example? Um, if, like, a genotype that's associated with um, aggression uh, results in an environment where uh, a person's more likely to be exposed to um, an unstable family environment as a child, then um, there might be a correlation between the aggression and the family environment, but and that Okay, so, 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 so I like Tammy's example a lot. I want to dig a little bit deeper into it because there's actually um, um, a subtlety that's very important. Um, so Tammy's example was you have a, um, an allele that's associated with aggressive behavior, um, but having that allele is correlated with some environment um, that's actually, and it's actually the environment that's causing the aggressive behavior, not, the, not that um, genotype. So, um, so if the, the um, genotype is causing people to select into a certain kind of environment that then leads to um, that person being aggressive, then according to this causal model that we have in mind, what your, that, that pathway would be a causal effect of the of the SNP. So even though it's operating through an environmental pathway, if you did the experiment of changing that allele from one to another, that's going to affect whether you end up in that environment and ultimately end up um, uh, having the aggressive behavior. So, so although in a sense that's gene environment correlation, um, that's a form of of the gene environment correlation that actually we would say is a causal effect of the, of the variant. 
But there's another version of that same story that would be um, predictive but not causal. And that would be if, for example, um, uh, you have a, an allele that causes um, parents to be not very nurturing of their children. And then um, parents with that allele tend to have children with that allele because they pass it on. And children who were not nurtured growing up are exposed to environments that cause that child to be more aggressive. So that would be a case where that allele is not causing the aggressive behavior, but it's correlated with the environment that generates the, the behavior. Um, and, and so in that case, if we did the, if the causal experiment of changing that child's allele, it wouldn't actually change whether the child was aggressive or not, because that has to do with the environment they grew up in, which is about their parents' allele. So that would be um, a kind of gene-environment correlation. That's what we, when we talk about gene-environment correlation, later today, actually, I think David, either today or tomorrow, is going to talk about it. He's going to mean that. He's going to mean correlation between genotype and what we would think of as exogenous environment, exogenous to the, to the individual as opposed to part of the pathway through which um, genes matter. That's, that's what I meant. I just, I didn't. Yeah, yeah, no, 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 no. Actually, I'm glad you phrased it the way you did, Tammy, because it was a, a good uh, opportunity to draw this distinction, which is really easy to miss and, and, and super important. <laughs> Thank you. Good strategy. OK, so good. So I think we've, we've uh, that was very useful, because now we really see the, the, the meaning of, of this definition of causal effect. Yeah, Dalton. Did, 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 I miss, did you mention things like that the variant isn't actually a causal variant, that's just an, um, are you not going to get into that? Oh, no, that's a great, no, I, I mean, I was just going to move on, because I didn't want to spend, you know, just go through all the cases of this. That Absolutely. Absolutely. So, so there are other, Dalton's pointing out other important examples where you get predictive but not causal. For example, one is where you, you, you which is also going to come up a lot, linkage disequilibrium is correlation between different SNPs. And so, um, so you get a SNP being associated, but it's not the causal SNP. It's actually some other SNP that's correlated with it that's causal, which is. And, and through assortative mating, you can actually have those be on completely different chromosomes. Blue eyes would be, cor would predict skin cancer, but they actually, you know, they have no causal, I mean, they might, I don't know, but <laughs> they might, no causal relationship biologically, it's just that they tend to go with lighter skin that, pr that makes you more likely to have skin cancer because of, of their biology. Yes, <laughs> yeah, so assortative mating is something also we're going to talk about, that's where people with, who are more similar genetically in some way tend to have children together, um, and and that is another. That's a, an important cause of um, correlation linkage disequilibrium um, that that can lead to um, a SNP being predictive but not causal. Okay. So, um, so in, if we want to have um, a causal relationship, if we want if we want to identify a causal relationship. Um, then we need to either study a population where we can randomly assign the genotype, which as we already talked about, you know, is done in a lot of biology, but we're not going to be able to do with humans. So what the strategy we're going to need to follow um, is including control variables, which we'll denote by Z, such that um, when we condition on Z, then the genotype vector x is as good as randomly assigned. So we have a natural experiment. Um, OK, so, so you know, as we, we talked about, um, we can get that kind of natural experiment. We mentioned this before. We can get that natural experiment by conditioning on parental genotypes. Because meiosis, in the process of meiosis, you get uh, random, randomly you get some, you know, some of your one parent's genetic material as opposed to another at each, uh, you know, throughout the genome. So you get that, um, that randomness. So that would be the ideal conditioning variable. Um, now, another possibility is to study siblings. And 
include family fixed effects as the controls. So, what it, so another way to put that is you look at how differences between siblings predict differences in the phenotype. So you know, we, we just said um, that the, um, it's random which genetic material you get from your parents. So we might think that the, or we, you know, it is correct, actually, that the differences among the siblings in their genotypes is random. Um, but um, there are, I think, two reasons why this strategy is not quite as ideal as conditioning on the parents' genotypes. It's a little subtle. So, but I'm, can you think of why, why it's not as ideal? Tom, cannot, Tom. Okay. okay. <laughs> it is about why there may be differences in sibling outcomes because of like family dynamics and processes, gender, social context. I mean, it, like a lot of factors that could play into that number of siblings. Um, so, so that's one. And then also you throw away a lot of the variation. Yes. Yeah, so you throw away a lot of the variation. That's that's. Uh, that's true, although you're also throwing away a lot, of, a lot of variation when you condition on parents' genotypes. Because uh, you're, you're, in both cases, you're throwing away the variation that's, that's between family variation and focusing on the within family variation. Um, so the other thing you mentioned was um, um, differences in birth order and sex, and number, of number of siblings. Yeah. So. Um, so it's a little tricky to think about some of those things, but I think I think birth order. Um, I mean, it is something that you, if you, um, I mean, you're you're essentially averaging over the effects of of the different birth orders. But I think that there is a. Um, so I'm not sure that it per se is is um, a problem, but but I think it's closely related, or may essentially be the same thing as something that is a slight issue one of the two issues that I had in mind, which is that um, when you condition on parents' genotypes, you could include a representative sample from the population. It could be, it could be people who come from single, you know, where they're the only child as well as people who have siblings. But if you're going to do this strategy, it only works in, within families that have two or more children. Um, and so you can't have a representative um, you know, you, you're, if there's something different about families with more than one child, um, you can't, um, you know, then, then you'll uh, be biased relative to what you would get in a representative sample um, with the family fixed effects. So that's one issue. Uh, the other, are you going to say something, Patrick? Well, I mean, Hari, Hari uh, chatted in saying it, it may shut off some potential causal pathways like genotype to environment to the outcome. But I think that's similar to what you were just saying, that there are certain sorts of environments that don't exist in, um, uh, in family data like that. Yeah. So it may be that, that exactly. So, so the, the argument was that there may be pathways that go from genotype to, so I, it was the same, the same kind of idea. Yeah. Other, other thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, so that's true. You have to be careful here. If these are not if these are not biological children, then you don't have the randomized experiment um, within the children. So what I what I had in mind here was was biological children, including family fixed effects. Yeah. If people who are more genetically similar are also raised more similar, you're going to get various effects. Um, so if people, this is interesting. So the, the point was, if people who are more genetically similar are also raised more similarly, which we think they would because they share parents. Um, well, the idea here, though, is that um, because we're looking at the differences among siblings, we're differencing out the, the similarity um, in the environment. So in principle, that shouldn't be a problem. 
Okay, so I'll, I'll uh, okay. Yeah. So we have we. You're right. So mono. So the the point here was that it's different. If you have monozygotic twins that are genetically identical versus dizygotic twins that are not genetically identical, that that's going to matter. And absolutely. In fact, you can't use monozygotic twins in this design because you're looking at genetic differences between them predicting the outcomes, and there are essentially are no genetic differences between the monozygotic twins. So that's another kind of person you have to throw out to do this kind of analysis, whereas you could have included them if you controlled for parental genotypes. OK, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, tell you the other thing I had in mind here, um, which is that um, if siblings' genotypes influence each other, which is uh, what we call sibling indirect effects, that's something that's going to um, show up here. Um, um, you know, let's say having uh, a, a sibling who is um, who has a, a, a high um, is genetically influenced to get more educational attainment. Um, that may affect the other sibling. You know, maybe if you you know you're seeing your sibling studying very hard, that gets you to study very hard, and so that changes your educational attainment. Um, so. Those kinds of effects show up in these estimates, and that's a, that's a kind of um, non-causal effect that you can pick up. Now, it turns out um, that there isn't much of that, um, at least the current e evidence is there isn't much of that going on with educational attainment. Um, so there may be cases where we, we, we don't think that's a very big bias, so this might give us, you know, the. Uh, pretty much the estimate we want, which is why I say it's not quite ideal, but maybe it is close enough to ideal in a lot of cases. So that's going to be a very useful research design, but you need to keep in mind that there are a couple of ways in which this, you know, in some circumstances you might not be getting quite the, the object you're interested in. Okay, um, now really not as good is controlling for ethnic background. The idea of controlling for ethnic background would be to try to deal with the po population stratification issues we talked about before. Why is that going to be, um, you know, w why might that uh, be pretty far from ideal? Yeah? Um, ethnicity is based largely on self reports. And so a person may or may not know their family's background or may um, choose to report something that may or may not be true. Absolutely. So that's one issue. Self reports, people, self reported ethnicity may not correspond very well with genetic ancestry. Um, so that, that's one issue. What else? So parents' ethnicities could be different from each other. And in that case, um, in that, you know, in that case, control, it, it's not clear. Do you want to control for both ethnicities? Is that the right thing to do? Maybe the family is raised in one of those cultures and not the other. Um, so you could get it wrong, potentially. Um, Ivan says that it doesn't account for recent stratification. Ivan, Ivan um, says that uh, recent stratification wouldn't be accounted for this. So it, um, more generally, it, it's not just the ethnic groups. It's not like, you know, all of the kind of population stratifications are captured by just the ethnic categories that we use. There could be, there's potentially lots of subcategories or subcultures that with recently, uh, you know, with, with somewhat different genetic ancestry recently, um, what we think of as more subtle population stratification that wouldn't be picked up here. So those, those are all good, good reasons. Okay, so um, what I'm gonna do now is 
Um, imagine that we've conditioned on z, but I'm going to just to keep the notation simple, I'm not going to carry it through everywhere. Um, and but one thing which is which is interesting um, is actually everything I'm going to say from here on out holds regardless of whether or not we condition on z or which z we condition on. You could do it either way. It's actually, you know, the, the, the arguments all go through, um, but the interpretation is different. Because if you've conditioned on the right z, if you've conditioned on parents' genotypes, say, then we're going to be able to interpret um, all of the genetic effects that come out of the model as causal. If we haven't conditioned on, um, on the right z, then there are going to be various ways in which the thing we're getting out is biased relative to the causal effects. Actually, yeah. Can I go back to, you, to why uh, isn't uh, controlling for terminal fixed effects a good idea? You said that way you're basically adjusting for the indirect sibling effect. But you, you're not capturing the, in, you, you, you're, there, there may be indirect sibling effects that are going to affect um, the, um, uh, the association between the differences between siblings and the differences between the outcome. Okay, and you're saying that uh, if we control the family fixed effect, then we're missing those. W those will still be part of the association, yes. Oh, they will still be. They'll still be part of the association, whereas if we condition our parents' genotypes, um, then they're, they're being uh, averaged out. They're, they're just part of the environmental noise. OK. Um, OK, so we're going to define, um, so we're going to, so we're just starting with this population of individuals. And now we're not talking about estimation. Now we're just uh, imagining you could think of this as an infinite population of individuals. Um, so we can know everything perfectly. And we're going to have um, values of the phenotype for educational attainment for each person. And we're going to have these genotype vectors for each person. And we'll define the genetic factor as um, the um, expected value of the phenotype given a person's genotype minus just the, the so this is the average uh, of the phenotype for the individuals with a given genotype minus the average of all the phenotypes in the population. Um, so this is. Um, this is the information that's contained in the genotype vector uh, for the phenotype because you, you can't do better than the, the expectation. Um, you know, that, that is your best guess of the phenotype given the genotype vector. And this is just normalizing it relative to the mean of the population. So we're talking about deviations relative to the population mean. Okay, so that's, that's what we mean by the, the genetic factor for the phenotype. Um, and so if we, we think about these deviations of the phenotype value from the population mean, um, we can always write a person's uh, phenotype deviation, or this y tilde, as the genetic factor plus something else that captures how wrong we were with our uh, expectation. And um, because the expectation is our best guess um, mathematically, the expected value of this noise term, given the genotype, has got to be zero. If it weren't zero, it wouldn't be our best guess in the first place. We could have done a, could have done a better job of predicting the phenotype. So it must be that on average, these errors across people are zero. OK, so. Um, Okay, so I'm going to keep the tilde over y in the slides so that everything is totally clear. But sometimes when people write down these models, they just assume everything is demeaned relative to the population and they don't write the tildes. Okay, so now this is, this is a, um, a key point here because we're going to talk a lot about the additive model uh, which, um, or the additive component of the genetic factor. So we want to be clear on, on what that is and what we, what we are or are not assuming when we focus on the additive model. So um, I'm going to 
define now the best linear predictor of the phenotype given the genotype vector. So the best linear predictor is something you've all seen. It's, it's just a regression. It's a linear regression. This is a population regression. So we're imagining doing this in an infinite sample so we can know exactly what the, the, the best linear fit is. And so that's giving us a function, a linear function, um, beta, uh, the vector of beta that's being multiplied by this genotype. So what that's saying, this, what that's saying is for each of these um, genetic variants that are zeros, ones, and twos, there's a single beta number, beta j, that's saying how we scale the phenotype uh, with the number of, of minor alleles. So there's a different beta j for each j, um, but we're not distinguishing, say, between 0 and 1 minor allele and 1 versus 2 minor allele. Um, we're not allowing for any interactions across the, uh, across the genetic variants. OK, so, so this is also this is called the population regression function, the best linear predictor function. Um, and now we can um, always decompose the genetic factor which, remember, was defined this way. We can decompose it um, by adding and subtracting the best linear predictor. And now, this term here, the best linear predictor minus the expected value, that's the additive component. Or that's the, what I'm calling A, the additive genetic factor. And this other bit, which is the um, the difference between what we would get from our best linear predictor and our best predictor overall is the non-additive component. Um, and, and by the properties of regression, when you run a regression, your residuals are always orthogonal to, um, uh, to your um, fitted values. So um, that means that this, the non-additive component and the additive component are orthogonal to each other. Um, so we can write the population model then, instead of writing it as the, as the uh, demean phenotype is the genetic factor plus noise, we can write it as the demean phenotype is the additive genetic factor plus the non-additive genetic factor plus noise where the noise still has expectation 0, conditional and genotype, and all three components are mutually orthogonal to each other. OK. Um, so now, we could dig deeper into this non-additive genetic factor. Um, and in fact, in the problem set, you did this in the, in the single locus case, you decomposed uh, you decomposed um, for a single locus. You got the dominance component relative to the additive component. So the dominance component is the nonlinear effect of genotype, that it could be different going from 0 to 1 or 1 to 2 in terms of the effect. Um, and then there's also, um, in the general case where, that we're doing now, where we have more than one um, locus, there's also epistatic components in the non-additive uh, component. Those are gene-gene interactions. Um, and there's actually many of these kinds of components. There's interactions between the additive components at two, loca at two variants, the interactions between the dominance components at two locations, an interaction between the additive component at one location and the dominance component at another location, triple interactions between the additive component, and so on. So there's actually you know, many, many, many of these epistatic components. Um, and you can... You can work through the model and, and derive, you know, derive a generalization or you know, keep decomposing things into all of these mutually orthogonal pieces um, and go as far as you, as far as you want. Um, OK. So when we focus on the additive model, what we're doing is grouping together the non-additive component and the error term into a single piece and calling that it's a new error term, epsilon. Um, uh, and remember um, that this original error term had mean 0. Non-additive component is demeaned, 
So conditional on x, it also has mean 0. That means this new error term is going to have mean 0. And all the components were mutually orthogonal. So that's going to mean that this new error term, epsilon, is orthogonal to the additive component. So, um, so this is where I want to pause for a moment and comment on why this is so important. Um, what you sometimes hear people say is that when people work with, when you work with the additive model, you're assuming away um, um, dominance effects and epistatic effects. Um, um, and that's what we've just shown is that that's not true. Uh, we can have in our minds a model where there are all of these non-additive effects and still work with the additive model. Um, and the way to think about it is that we are, um, we're not assuming those things don't exist. We're just putting them in the error term. And we're focusing on the best linear predictor, the best linear approximation to, um, to the general model that we think is really there. Um, so we haven't talked about this explicitly, but it's, there's a similar point to be made about gene environment interactions. There can also be those going on in the background, and we're averaging over those as well when we talk about um, the additive model. We're not assuming they don't exist. We're just treating these, these betas as, as um, average causal effects, averaged over dominance effects that might be there, epistatic effects, and gene environment interactions. OK, and then here's the, the more general version. If we don't suppress the covariates, then we also have this z that we're conditioning on that lets us say that, that x is ca the causal effect. And so or the beta is the causal effect of the, of the x. So the, with the, if we're conditioning on such that we have this, um, these causal effects, then this beta vector is what we would call the vector of genetic effects. And the interpretation um, is that for any given location in the genome J, beta J is the average causal effect of this hypothetical experiment. Um, it's the average effect in that it's not necessarily the effect for any one person if you did this experiment. But on average, across the, the population, across you know, people who might have different genotypes at different locations, and so there's different dominance and epistatic effects, and different people exposed to different environments, so there's different environmental effects. It's the average in the population of the effect of doing this experiment. OK, so here's the scalar version of the model. And we're going to talk throughout the, the course about um, various uh, extensions to the, to the additive model as well. But the additive model itself is going to play uh, an important role. OK, so any questions about this? All right, so in the last five minutes, I'm just going to do a, a whirlwind tour through the rest of the two weeks and how it relates to what we just talked about. Um, so, um, so we're going to start today um, with um, there's going to be two talks today about the potential payoffs of social science genomics for psychology and sociology. We're not going to talk about economics uh, today, but since David is going to do the, the lecture on applications in social science, he'll have a bit of an economics emphasis in, in that talk. Um, and also coming up um, very soon will be Daphne and Michelle's talks on the ethical and communication issues um, that we've, uh, we've already talked about how important those are. OK, so the second big topic, which is also going to be interleaved uh, today, uh, is behavior genetics. So behavior genetics predates the availability of um, genetic data. In fact, it goes back um, at, at least 100 years at this point. Um, and the way to think about behavior genetics in terms of the causal model is that you know, we're not going to be able to estimate the beta j's if you don't actually have genetic data. 
But what we can do is define, is think about this additive genetic factor as a whole, or the genetic factor as a whole. Um, and we can ask, how important is it in the sense of how much of the variation in the population in the phenotype is explained by variation across people in the genetic factor or in the additive genetic factor? And that's called heritability. But David's going to start talking about, uh, about that today. And it's useful to understand the approaches in behavior genetics um, because, it, first of all, it'll deepen our understanding of the causal model that we just talked about. But it also plays a role then when we get access to genetic data because it's going to, it's going to be informative um, in lots of ways. For example, um, the amount of variation in the population explained by the additive genetic factor is going to be an upper bound on how much we could ever actually explain with a polygenic index that we construct from genetic data in a linear way to explain uh, variation across people. Um, and then there's going to be ways that we, we try to estimate heritability from genetic data itself, and it's useful to have comparisons with, um, with estimates based on twins or adoption studies, which is the way be behavior genetics worked um, or, and continues to work. Okay, so the next topic will be uh, molecular genetics. Um, this is what Andrea is going to uh, teach a sequence of lectures about. Um, and, you know, it's for... I, it's important to understand the basic biology underlying this data because we're going to make lots of assumptions about the data and we need to understand why those assumptions are usually justified, when they might fail, um, where the data come from that we're working with and what new data might be available in the next few years. Um, we're going to want to think about biological mechanisms by which genes are going to matter for psychological characteristics that ultimately end up affecting the kind of social science outcomes that we're interested in. And we want to understand at a biological level how some of the environmental interactions might uh, actually uh, happen, like uh, affecting gene expression, for example, um, through mechanisms like epigenetics. OK, so then the next topic is going to be um, gene discovery, so identifying which genetic variants are associated with, with um, the phenotype, so estimating these betas, um, getting beta hats. And that's important to understand um, because um, you're going to want to know which gene discovery papers you can rely on um, to build on in, in your own work. Um, and we're, it's also going to be where we introduce the challenges, the central challenges that have come in applications, the challenges of statistical power, multiple hypothesis and, uh, testing, and population stratification that are going to come up again in, in applications of the data. OK, so then the next topic, which is really a, a set of topics that I'm lumping together here, are all kind of unified by the theme of exploiting the aggregate information in the genome. Um, so trying to get, um, you know, uh, learn more about this um, um, additive genetic factor as a whole. So the idea here is that the individual loci are, are for complex phenotypes like we're interested in are going to have small effects. But altogether, the effects uh, can be substantial on the phenotype. So we're going to talk about constructing a polygenic index that tries to combine all the information across the variants. We're going to talk about genetic correlation, um, which is looking at m two phenotypes at the same time and saying, what is the correlation on the genetic effects on those phenotypes or the correlation uh, between the additive genetic factors? And we're going to talk about partitioning. Um, which is a way of trying to understand something about biological mechanism or, or other kind of mechanism. You ask, are the genetic effects larger for um, variants that are in some kinds of biological pathways uh, rather than others? Okay, then the next topic is on environmental effects. So we'll talk about gene environment correlation, um, gene environment interaction, Mendelian randomization, um, which is a way of trying to infer the causal effects of environments um, on an outcome uh, using genetic data. Um, and we'll talk about um, epigenetics, functional genomics, and life course development. Um, so this is really where we get into you know, the, the, the heart of the social science-y um, uh, topics. And then we'll talk um, more specifically about uh, applications um, 
going into detail on some of our favorite applications of genetic data. And we'll also then uh, talk about the research ideas that you guys have come up with and, and, um, um, and we'll discuss uh, what the future may look like in terms of um, the field and, and promising directions uh, to go in. Okay, so let me end with just a couple of key themes that will recur throughout the two weeks. Um, one, which is reflected on the, uh, the bags, uh, the, the tote bags that you have, is that uh, empirical results are informative only if the analyses are well-powered. Um, the three central challenges uh, that come up in gene discovery, but also in empirical work of statistical power, multiple hypothesis testing, and population stratification. Another key theme that we've already touched on when we talked about the um, Tammy's very clever question um, uh, was about the genetic effects uh, very often operate through environmental mechanisms. And that's a very, very important uh, point that um, will come up again and again. Um, and then another important point is that when we control for the parental genotypes, we can infer causal genetic effects. And that's um, going to be uh, super important in the applications. Okay, so, um, so let's stop here and take a break uh, and resume in um, 15 minutes.